This is Speak Up. I am Sandra Schulte. Welcome back to our show. I am delighted to have Peter Yusey back with us again. Thank you so much for coming back. Thank you, Sandra. From Washington. Would you, uh, would we let, when, I would like you to continue talking about the things that we thought about as our inalienable rights. As an example, the ability to freely choose where you live, no matter what your race. Uh, this is a big one, and it's just beginning to filter up. It was started by the Obama administration. They demanded Westchester County build multifamily units yes. in the middle of the suburbs, which is an apartment building. Mm -hmm. In of itself, not a bad thing, but where you have zoned single family homes and you start putting high rises, it kind of changes the nature of the neighborhood. and home values go down. So Westchester County fought that very hard in court and uh, they either won or HUD with, withdrew the idea. Well, I live in Montgomery County in Maryland and we are the People's Republic of Maryland. We're trying to emulate California, literally, they, that's what the county council and the state legislature, they, they're absolutely, we're going to, we're going to outdo California in terms of some of these ideas. And so what they're trying to do in what's called 2050, which is yes. the plan for the county to the year 2050, is put multifamily dwellings by law mm -hmm. all over suburbia. Well, suburbia is the swing vote in all the major battleground states. <coughs> so if you take the suburban area around Philadelphia or around Detroit, around Milwaukee, around Atlanta, that's the vote that swings. Either votes one way or the other. And if you make it all urban, like New York City or downtown Atlanta or Milwaukee, it'll be 80-20 progressive, which is what they want to do. And the question here is, you're now, because you decided you wanted to live in a certain place, getting punished for it. In the District of Columbia, what's interesting is PG County, Prince William County, in Virginia, a lot of minorities moved out there because they didn't like this DC because the taxes were too high, crime got a little crazy in our city, and the schools were terrible. And the people who moved out were the very minorities which supposedly were left behind. Yes. And that's why they call them, you look at Prince George's County, it's a majority county that is minority. Uh -huh. Okay. And there are tens of thousands of black folks out there who live a great life, because it's suburbia. They, they like it. Schools are good, homes are good, got enough, you know. But now we're being told yards are racist by Mr. Buttigieg. <laughs> Supposedly, if you have to water your lawn, and, and, and it's somehow uh, unlike the city where you have cement and sidewalks and stuff. But it, it again, it is, it's like punishing people for wanting to live in Montana. I have two brothers, one in Montana, one in Idaho. Uh, they like living on the side of a mountain. You know, another one lives, uh, he, he works in the oil fields. So it, it, the opportunity in America to move, people are kind of amazed around the world, is they grow up in a village and they never leave it. I, I remember uh, visiting parts of uh, Italy in which the are they're the brother of the head of the family owned a restaurant in D.C. Yes. One of the best, beautiful restaurants. And when he knew I was going on my honeymoon to Italy, he said, look up my brother. They had never lived the village. That's where they grew up. Their father grew up there. Their grandparents grew up there. And Joseph, who came to America, was the one guy, they said, oh, you're crazy. You're going to get a boat and you're going to get lost in a storm. Well, he ended up owning one of the most beautiful restaurants in Washington, D.C., Cantina d'Italia. And I remember going back to Italy and we went to dinner and we never got a bill. It was in Genoa, mm -hmm. uh, right at the seaport. So it was, was wonderful. But this, 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 is, this is going on in a lot of parts of America, this attempt to funnel growth in the suburbs to new immigrants and particularly illegal immigrants that will be given these vouchers to live in these and then eventually amnesty. So it's part of an immigration policy, which is 
totally out of bounds of what our, what our immigration goals and objectives have always been. We've always been enriched by people coming here from different parts of the world. I mean, my parents came here from Germany in 1933. They didn't know each other, but they came at the same time. So uh, it's fascinating. When they didn't know what was going to happen. They were, they were sponsored. They had a job. My grandfather yes. had a job at Dartmouth College. But my dad was 13 or 14 years old. I don't think he spoke English. I got immersed in a, uh, a preparatory school called Putney for high school. And so uh, that right, you take that away, which is mobility, and you do that with restricting the use of cars. <sighs> you know, I, the other day, just for the heck of it, I, I figured out it would take me two and a half hours to get to work by public transportation. Mm -hmm. I have to go outside, walk a mile to the bus stop, yes. take a ride on, which comes every 45 minutes, then get the subway to Metro Center, change, take the subway to Frederick Square, and then walk uh, about half a quarter of a mile to the office. I don't have two and a half hours every morning and every evening to get to work. I know, I know people who travel 100 miles, for crying out loud, from West Virginia and drive. Can you imagine if they, I mean, some people take the train, which is the Mark train actually works very well if you're somewhat near, okay? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was thinking of moving to Gettysburg, Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania, which I love, uh, not just for the battleground there, which is just unbelievable, but the people and the unique restaurants and so forth is, but that's a, it's 82 miles. So it's l almost two hours, depending on how bad the traffic is. So I would be spending, I'm 14 miles away from the city where I'm now, I spent two and a half hours. And to force people to go through that you're going to have a lot of really angry. And there's a whole thing about restricting your ability to drive and your restrict your ability where you live, and it has to do. I, my own view is all schools should be private and unions should go away, and parents should have school choice. You should be able to send your children because schools in America for a long time were all private, and, and I think parents should elect the teachers and the school board. I know that's apostasy. <laughs> I'm not against teachers. Again, I, they, they make as much money as we need to pay them to get good teachers. Now we have um, we have Biden going to Iraq. Uh, I was it Iran to try to cool things down. I don't know. I don't think he's going to Iran. Was Iraq? Maybe he's going to meet with the Iranians somewhere. Yes. Like in Geneva. Hmm. But uh, the Secret Service never let him go. Okay. Because he wouldn't, some crazy might shoot somebody. And if I'm president, I'd say I don't blame my vote and go anywhere near the country. Or trying to. Uh, He's trying to make a deal with them. That's right. I, I, how crazy okay. is that? Well, most of my life for the last 40 years has been in the nuclear weapons arena and particularly four countries Iran, North Korea, Russia, and China. And when we started with the Reagan administration, we inherited the following. Yes, go on. We have handed a arms control framework called SALT, Strategic Arm Limitation Talks, mm -hmm. which allowed the Russians to build up to 13,000 warheads and 13, allowed the United States to build up to a little over 12,000. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason was our weapons on submarines and bombers weren't as numerous per missile as Russian big land-based missiles, what were called heavy missiles. So we had that. The Russians had proposed a freeze because they were way ahead. We hadn't modernized our ICBMs. Uh, we hadn't modernized yet. Uh, we hadn't built the Ohio class submarine yet. The C-4 missile was not in production. And we're having fights over whether we should build the B-1 or the B-2 and the Senate would kill one and the House would kill the other. And it was kind of a mess. Uh, and, and then the Russians invaded Afghanistan. The Shah of Iran fell. Nicaragua went down the tubes to the Sandinistas. The Panama Canal, we for some reason gave back to some clowns who ended up being drug dealers and pretty bad people. And then if you look at the period 
where Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam all fell to the communists, but another 20 countries fell to the communists during the 1970s, and then on top of which they invaded Afghanistan. So it was a, um, we had what was called a hollow army. Uh, Al Haig called it that, a number of other military officers did, is that we had a structure of an army, but there wasn't anything there to mm. fight because it was so poorly trained. Drug abuse and alcoholism was terrible. I know Al Haig, when he left the White House and went In and became the army? Head, head, of the, uh, head of NATO, yes, he saved our American forces in NATO from being destroyed because internally, because of the drugs and alcohol. Wow. He had to, and remember, we were also going to a volunteer force right. from a draft, and Vietnam was ending. So that's what we inherited. Mm. We also inherited 14% inflation, 21% interest rates, eventually a 10% uh, unemployment rate, and what was described by the media as stagflation, which was you had high inflation or low growth. Because it always assumed that, well, you could have high growth and high inflation, but not high inflation and no growth, which is what we did. And uh, it was described by the media as malaise. Uh, President Carter never gave that, we used the word, but he gave a speech about how we were all kind of, um, he didn't say we were down in the dumps uh, because everything was bad. He said, well, we're down in the dumps because we're selfish. We got to, you know, he, he put a sweater on and said, we got to turn the heat down. <laughs> so President Reagan comes in and, and what's interesting in the history books, they don't explain how in 11 years, it all changed. We had 22 million jobs created. Mm -hmm. Inflation was knocked down dramatically. We started producing oil and gas again. Mm -hmm. Oil prices went from $15 a barrel, I think $6 a barrel. Uh, yes, Gorbachev became head of the Soviet Union, but what he did, he walked out of the arms control talks right away. He sent more troops to Afghanistan more money to the Sandinistas, built more SS-20 missiles aimed at Europe, uh, and basically told President of the United States, Reagan, I'm gonna outmuscle you. Sounds Reagan, familiar, how about that? Reagan <laughs> didn't blink. Yes. He said, we're gonna deploy our Persians and Glickums in Europe, which Carter had never done. Uh -huh. Carter never even put any money in the budget for it. He built up the economy so that it had boomed like it hadn't in, since the, remember, John Kennedy inherited a. In 62, we had a recession and then proposed a tax cut that Johnson put in and then ruined it because of inflation caused by the spending on Vietnam. So we had a boom in the Johnson years, but it also was, the, the Vietnam was so terrible. It so undid a lot of things about America. So Reagan did things that were extraordinary. We had a real problem with drugs and crime. And finally we got crime under control. So by the late 1980s, and it come down significantly. And NATO got reestablished. Re uh, Thatcher was a godsend, as was Kohl of Germany. And the other person that people don't talk about, but was great, was Pope John, Pope John. Because mm. when we said, we want to help solidarity, the British, uh, excuse me, the uh, Polish uh, dock workers union, they were put under martial law and all the men went to jail. So how to keep them alive, how to keep them away. We had to pay the women, the families. We had to have give them Xerox machines, phones. Mm -hmm. And the reason was we had over 1,200 private newspapers in the underground in Poland by Solidarity. And that kept Solidarities talking to each other. Yes. So eventually in 1991, Wek Lewensa could run for president. First time any freely elected president in any Warsaw Pact country was able to run any one like 90 some odd percent of the vote and that was the end of the Soviet Union. And it was, Carter did support solidarity. I gotta give him credit for that. But Reagan had the brilliant go to Pope John, Pope John because there's not a person in the world who knew Poland better than a Polish Pope. That's right who had been a priest in that country. And so we were able to save solidarity, which was key 
to emboldening solidarity to stay alive until eventually martial law was lifted and Lech Walesa ran for president of the country. And, and so economically, and then we rebuilt the US military. We built a 600 ship Navy. We deployed an entire nuclear modernization program from bombers, subs, land-based missiles, cruise missiles, uh, against all odds, because we were told we couldn't do it. Uh, we were told that, uh, oh, if we deployed the SS-20s in Europe, well, we'd, we'd make war, but blow the world up. And we gave money to the democratic resistance in Nicaragua, who turned out to be the democratic resistance in Nicaragua, and defeated the Sandin, forced the Sandinistas to have an election, which they tried very hard to rig, but God bless Mrs. Tremora, uh, her husband ran La Prince of the magazine or newspaper, who was killed by the Sandinistas. And so she took things seriously, but, and in Salvador, we helped the Salvadoran government with enough military assistance. Remember, the opponents wanted to give them blankets and economic assistance, but no military aid. The question is, how do you fight a civil war when you're not given military assistance because Salvador did not have their own domestic arms industry. And that was the bloodiest civil war I've ever seen. But the Sandinistas lost and Salvador won. Angola unfortunately stayed communist, but what had cost the Russians $16 billion a year, their empire, mm -hmm. we got rid of all the bank loans. No banks gave them any loans anymore. Eastern Europe, you're on your own. So the Russians said, oh man, it's bad. By the end of the 90, 80s, 91, uh, Warren Norquist figured out the Russian cost of their empire was approaching $100 billion. And they only had $30 billion a year in foreign exchange, mainly oil and gas mm -hmm. and weapons exports. So they were bro that, when people say they're broke, you understand this was a lot more than spending money just for their own military. They had an empire that cost them an enormous amount to, to maintain. Black. And Reagan said, I, I'm not gonna get rid of Moscow. I'm not trying to overthrow the government of Russia. I'm trying to get rid of the empire. And that's what he did. Because when Gorbachev said, it's the end signed and said the end of the Soviet Union, he went back to being, you know, head of Russia. And then Yeltsin became head of Russia. To me, it was, didn't threaten the Russian heartland, but threatened their periphery over which from Cuba to Nicaragua to Angola to Afghanistan was their empire, which was making it so difficult for the rest of the world to be at peace. So what do we do today with China? Uh, oh, now, see, that's the $60,000 question, is China now does seems to replace 100 Russia. times more economically than Russia, mm -hmm. but it makes them more vulnerable because that we can take away from them because we gave it to them in the first place. What do you do with China? Because that is the $64,000 question, which we are just beginning to admit we need to ask the question. Because yes. we don't know yet how to do it. We, we have ideas, but we have, unfortunately, Wall Street, the universities. The universities love the money from Chinese students and the free teachers. Wall Street loves the investment money to buy Chinese stocks. And also from our big multinational corporations love having their big footprint in China. Yes, unfortunately with the NBA and Facebook. So, but Congress finally has a good majority now understand this cannot continue. Otherwise we're gonna be killed economically. Yes. Okay, and so we have to figure out, okay, how serious is this? I think the answer is deadly serious. Number two, Deadly series is right. what can you do about it? That's where we are. We're mm. just beginning. I'm part of a group called Committee on the Present Danger slash China. They just met again this right. afternoon. Uh, if people want to join, they can get in touch with me at uh, puc at hudson.org. And that's the question Congress is now asking. Uh, Trump, to his credit, started asking that question and implementing some of it. But to give you one example, there's a dragon lady in China who runs their nuclear program for North Korea. She has over a hundred entities, public, private, military, government, that she works, that are her, she's the boss. Every single one of them work with North Korea 
to build nuclear weapons in North Korea. In North Korea. Now, if you take all of them, and one of my friends at Hudson, David Asher, did the sanctions in for the government my for just a minute. I, <laughs> one more sentence. He did the sanctions numbers for yes. Russia and China. Yes. He did a chart. Out of the 130, 40 entities, we've only sanctioned 12. Okay? And they're all Chinese. And they're banks, they're cyber groups, they're, they help the North Koreans do nothing but do their missiles and do their nukes, as well as Pakistan, Libya, Iran, and Iraq. Iran and Iraq, the, the Iran's bad, Iraq's gone, Libya, no nukes, but Pakistan's bad. So China did all this. And that is, if you want to be serious, Wall Street's going to have a heart attack. Okay? But you either are serious or you're not. Well, you give up to the United States. Well, if, if, if you're going to fight, it's like Afghanistan and Iraq and the war and Ukraine. Are you serious? Okay. You're serious about this, Mr. President. Do you know what it's going to take? I don't mean Mr. President, Mr. Biden. I mean everybody, Mr. President. Are you serious about doing this job? Yeah. Well, this is what you have to do to be serious. Oh, no, we can't do that. NATO won't like it. Well, then you're not serious, and all you're doing is muddling through, and it's just going to be basically more Ukrainians dying because we're not willing to stand up and say, we have to do the following, and if you think it's going to make the Russians use nukes, well, then you've got to decide whether you're going to back off or not. But be honest. Don't send all this money and all it is doing is getting thousands and thousands of Ukrainians killed and more and more of their country blown up. Get serious. It's the same thing with drugs, immigration, energy, everything. Get serious. You can't play at these games. We're playing at immigration like, oh, that's not who we are. Well, you get five million people here illegally, some of them terrorists. They're trafficking women and children. And bringing fentanyl. Yeah. Fentanyl. And, and, and this tells me, the world looks at this and goes, the Chinese call this the reverse opium war. They're making war on us with drugs. And they're laughing because they don't think we're serious about dealing with the problem. And my view, there's one, you asked one message. There's one message. One message. Get serious, America. Okay? And we usually, when we get serious, like World War II, like this Korean uh, Civil War, like World War I, okay? Like what Reagan did in, in the Cold War. When we get serious, we win. Because that's who we are. We're an extraordinarily talented, gifted country with enormous uh, faith Talent. in God. And that, to me, is critical because we're doing something bigger than ourselves. This is not a selfish thing. We supported solidarity not because it helped New York or Wisconsin, okay? It's because those are our brothers and sisters. And they thought the same about us. They fought for freedom everywhere. And to me, they did that in 1683 against the Ottoman Empire and the gates of Vienna with the Polish king. Albeit he was so fat, they had to have four or five guys lift him up on, on top of his horse. <laughs> It's kind of an interesting story. But Poles are interesting. They do that, and then they solidarity is the fulcrum on which the Cold War was won. And now it's not Poland, but it's Ukraine, same part of the world, that is the key to this thing about, you know, are the Russians going to be go back in their cage? Mm. Or are we going to let them, if they take Ukraine, Poland and the Baltics is next. Sure, think of, of Germany. We let Germany well, that out would of the be bag. That be, they would take off. Germany would be a little tough, but Poland is. I'm just saying but the Baltics, the past, the the Baltics are we're worried, really yes. worried about that, yes. and I think that's why. But we should, as I said, I, I can't say it. I, I say it all the time. Get serious, America. This isn't a game you can play, because you look at what's going on in Ukraine. Tens of thousands of people are losing their lives, their homes. Places being bombed to hell by Russia's bombing hospitals, schools, kidnapping children, raping women. It, it cannot go on. And if you're not serious, then what are you there for? Okay? And that's to me, if, I don't care if it's a city council in New York, state legislature in New York. I don't care if it's a dog catcher in, you know, dog breath Idaho. Get serious about the job you're meant to do and do it. And I tell you, we're good at it when we figure out Okay, folks, we got to do this. Okay? And that's what leadership is. Leadership is saying, not this is easy, or oh, I found a tricky way to, is 
this is going to take some time and effort, and it's going to be tough, but we're going to get it done. And my mind is all the things we talked about in these discussions, every one of them are hurting America dramatically, all of which we have the power to stop. That's very important, would you say? Yes, very, very important. That we, can, we can stop all this stuff. Yes. There's nothing inevitable about 107, 8,000 people dying of opiate addiction. We just have to say, say to ourselves, is this meaningful? Is this important to us? Yeah, and my worry is there's uh, too much in the media and academia uh, that says, oh, you can't solve these problems. And doesn't want to solve them for some reason. To me, that's what you're telling Who young people. The money? Well, what you're telling young people is they have no future. And then you wonder why the suicide rate and the cutting and the emotional upsets and the mental illnesses among our young people in this country is, is, is so bad. It's not, not what folks died on Omaha Beach for. Okay, that, it's not what folks died in Korea for or Vietnam. Okay. Or, and I mean in terms of also State Department people who gave up their lives and Peace Corps people and foreign, you know, foreign service, they, they sometimes have da dangerous jobs too, it's not just soldiers. It's everybody who has served this country to protect it. The guy painting the boat, George Washington Bridge, the guy building cars in, in Detroit, they all are building America and they're saying, you have to have our back, Mr. President, Mr. Senator, Mr. Congressman, Mr. Governor, because that's what we put you in there for. You have to have our back. And if you don't and you're not serious, you're letting us all down. I've got I want, the dream. That's what I want someone to get up to say. And I don't care who it is. If they're genuine and they say that, that's what Reagan said. That's what John Kennedy said. And that's what George Bush said on that pile of rubble on 9-11. I mean, that's why I think everybody loved him. What did he say? He was on top of the rubble and he said, somebody is going to hear from us soon. And that's getting serious. Thank you very much. And thank you, Sandra. Always a pleasure. This is Speak Up. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day. Goodbye.